planet, third planet from the sun, and we have September 25th. I uh, do a short summary webinar on DNA, and I have Ben with me. Hey, Ben. Thank you for joining. So Takur asked me to explain a little more about uh, about DNA, you know, the human, human science, more or less, so people can understand the hybridization a little better. And I will try that. And Ben, thank you for joining me, and please um, develop the dialogue, so I don't do monologue, let's do a dialogue. And I, now okay, I will... Uh, yes, thank you. And now I will do my... Uh, my uh, drawing board so you can we can do like some sort of a picture here okay almost ready almost good and welcome so we're oh it doesn't draw well let me try another one we're human colony dot org can you see it all right perfect is uh, it uh, properly there. spelled on your screen Absolutely. On on my screen, it's uh, it's actually uh, a mirror, but I think that that's convenient. That's okay. <laughs> You're good. All right, and Very you perfect. can find us on YouTube by searching. You abbreviate human colony to H U C O U C O L O H U C O L O, and on YouTube, if you search U C O L O or just search search H U C O L O on Google, you will find us. Nice. Um, so, what are the questions I want to cover today? I started with the bigger question, uh, healing and uh, ascension, but really, to be brief, let's do only the only the very simple thing. Uh, let's do uh, hybridization and DNA. Um, and let's start with something sophisticated. The main question would be, uh, I mean, something advanced, or not specifically advanced. Nice that you turn, turn, turn on your camera, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, how does alien DNA get into us? That is a big one. Uh, and um, why do they do that? It's, I guess it's beyond that. And what are the other questions? You asked about animals, right? So how animals well, came, came about, yes. Yeah. Because essentially, what, what I'm to understand, uh, what I'm really intrigued by are the Anubians, which um, is the dog, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, dog humans, yeah, humanoid dogs. Anubis, right, was the Egyptian. Um, yes, yes. So the Anubians are the dogs, and I just had a fascination with, okay, does that mean that's where dogs come from? And Lyra, is that where we get all of our cats? You know, I just... It'd be interesting to figure that concept out because in that concept as well, that's really what we're hybridizing with is alien concepts of these uh, base structures. Yes, and and I uh, these are tough questions, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, because we know we are very similar to other animals on Earth, and we know that evolution. That I'm I'm pretty sure Dar Darwin theory of evolution is. Largely, largely correct. We, I mean, there was a timeline oh, yeah. of, of evolution on Earth. So For how sure. did uh, the that how did we come about, right? Okay. So we have yeah. that classical thing from uh, bacteria into, I guess, multicellular organisms. Yeah, multicellular. And then to some sort of simplistic structures like. Uh, Tubes, I don't remember even that. And then you get into more sophisticated structures, multi cells, and there is a head, and then it goes into some sort of fish, right? I will draw a fish, and then it goes into frogs. Hmm, I don't know how to draw a frog. Something like <laughs> jumping, something jumping, and then you get lizards, right? And then you get mammals. And what's good about mammals is they have live birth and they have, I will draw a live birth, and they have mammal glands and they, they have a belly where they carry the, the baby. So it's live birth. And I guess smiley mammal. 
Well, my question is too: is it, it that it can't just be just a linear timeline like that, right? Uh, because the reptiles and us, there's so many diff different variations, right? It, it can't just be that simple. I will draw a mouse for a mammal. Um, I'm, just, I'm just curious, like what that offshoot, how that happened. <clears throat> I will keep the question kind of open because, I mean, it's some sort of a mammal. All right. Uh, and it has mammal glands right here. All right. Uh, mammary glands. Mammary glands. Um, so how... Uh, we are in humans, right? Let me draw a human. We are similar to our bacteria. So there is... Continuous line, which is unmistakable, you know, it's, uh, if you look at the genomes, I miss a human, right? If you look at genomes of this species, they're all sequenced, all, all, the, all the key gene sequence, the DNA sequence, so you just find that there is a continuous, let me switch it back to, to show me, there is a continuous, uh, a uh, line of uh, one go, one goes into another, right? And uh, you can see the evolution. You can see the relation. Uh, the scientists used to draw these trees. What I want to do is to draw a tree, uh, and it's pretty easy to do. It's pretty. I guess I can do that, right? Oh, yeah can do that. You can pretty easy to do. You, as th these are called phylogenetic trees. You take the sequences of the genomes and if you look at science phylogenetic trees you can find yeah. tons of them. Right, yeah. And uh, these are computer generated. There is no cheating there. You take just genomes of this species and they give you unmistakable phylogenetic tree like that. And that's, a, you know, that's modern proof of Dar Darwin's theory. Like in the past it was questioned, but right now you can easily see that if you sequence the DNA, uh, we are all related. We, you know, Darwin's theory is con confirms really well through phylogenetic trees. And it, it starts from very simple and it goes all the way to to human lineages. Even, even human tribes can, can be built like that, uh, just from sequencing different humans. It's, it's absolutely true. It's, um, I guess, we create our reality, but it is our collective reality is, uh, you know, all agrees with that truth. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, scientific reality agrees with that truth. Uh, so I guess the question is, somewhere in this tree there might be air, I will take a different color, infusion, that's why we call it infusion. Somewhere in the past they infuse here and there. They come and infuse. And uh, also if you look at the dating of these divisions, it's like nothing, 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 nothing. It should be a different color, but it is nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing happens. Very little diversity, very little uh, generation of species. And then there is, I don't forgot how they call it, explosion of species generation, explosion of diversity. And scientists who study that, and I actually know this once in person because um, we were friends, in, at, at school friends, uh, they just uh, are amazed how uh, it's not only one, 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 one split like that. It was multiple splits happen at the same time. It, it was like God came at that time and said, now you guys, I mean, now we, from that we create tons of others. Or, some, or, I mean, another hypothesis would be that aliens came and there was a lab here which generated lots of species and let them, uh, let them uh, live longer, uh, continue, but they would not create the species, they would kind of generate this species from what exists here. And again, next hypothesis would be that it was uh, non non physical beings. How do you call them? Non corporeal beings. Non corporeal, like not very corporeal. Um, 
like fairies. Fairies, when we uh, interview the fairy, I guess until now we were speaking mostly about mainstream science and now we just jump into fairies. But you know, we channel and, hey Sarah, uh, we channel and Jim's uh, channeled uh, a fairy and fairy just said, yes, it's their job to participate in creation of new species. Uh, when I read Michael Newton, Michael Newton is a scientist, scientist who, who interviewed a lot of people having he he does hypnotic regressions and publishes the summaries of these regressions, mostly with quotes and explanations. So, so he does tons of that. So once a soul in in one of his book, a soul or um, a person uh, sort of hypnotically channeling his soul. His soul says that uh, one of his its favorites, uh, favorite jobs is to create new species. And because that soul is a beginner in creating new species, she was mostly specializes on simple fishes, on fish. And she, she, she did very good creating new species of fish. So I guess it is partly, in large extent, it is spiritual creation. Uh, fairies and spiritual beings create those. So, so they manipulate the DNA and, and uh, help it to rearrange into creation of new species. So, <clears throat> so what we know, again, we know that all these dogs and cats are, which we have, they are from Earth. Most of their genome is Again, looking at this tree, let, let me draw a cat here. So there would be a cat here somewhere. At the end, right? It would be a cat. Can you see? No, I can't. A cat. All right. And you have a dog, which is actually very similar to a cat in many ways. It's like the structure is about the same. It's a mammal and it's a predatory mammal. Oh, sorry, the, the, the ears are different. And the tail is different, but otherwise they are similar in many ways, right? So these are uh, clearly have origin on Earth, but uh, also we know that there are ancient dogs and right. cats on other planets, and they're different. They could be humanoid, it could be you know, big big lions or something, but they they are on other planets. So. Um, there was some infusion at some point, and uh, it could be infusion on material level, it could be infusion on spiritual level, which directed the evolution in this way. And I guess, and my, my best educated guess from what I heard so far, it is, it is both. It is coordinated uh, activity, uh, spiritual and, and uh, I would say alien. They, they they kind of interact and they drive their their development of species. So so um, my my question was, does this I guess that happens on our planet and we know the timing and it happens on other planets and they know their timing. My question was, does our timing correspond to their timing? Is it the same? Synchronous development, you know, only dinosaurs, then only mammals, and that sort of thing. Uh, or was it uh, an insect somewhere in there, and or or is it shifted some somewhat? And um, so far, my the answer I, I'm getting through channelings is from you know, through Jim mostly, uh, uh, but not only um, is that there is a general pattern but there are lots of exceptions there is a lot of exceptions so so it's it's not necessary so the different planets develop at their own timings so so it's it's not synchronized across the galaxy or across the universe it's um it's shifted it is shifted but again there is a huge infusion of uh humans, right, which came way after, in, in the galaxy, which came after, uh, way after insects in the galaxy and reptilians in the galaxy. So there is a, a major, a major sort of infusion of new idea and a new, um, it's not a species, it's kind of 
wider class of humans, uh, which which happens uh, in a timely fashion. But but later it is it, on different planets. Uh, there is different different timings. I guess uh, that should answer your question, right? Well, I mean, uh, and that's kind of the interesting concept too, because um, if you really see as far as the different species of dogs, that's that's more or less been our uh, our doing. I know that the different breeds, etc., have been just a mass manipulation of DNA. But uh, I just wanted to bring up on that concept. You did answer, you know, kind of a lot of it. But uh, what is it? I remember seeing statues online of humans uh, riding dinosaurs. They were so I, I just thought that was an interesting concept as well. Um, I'm reading now um, a book called Urantia, Urantia book. And they tell pretty much in the mainstream language, they use mainstream language to and it was published first time sixty years ago. Uh, they tell the story including the evolution, including uh, the um, this question of you know did humans ride the dinosaurs? And uh, as I understand, it is possible we overlapped, but barely. And those humans who, who rode dinosaurs weren't Homo sapiens yet. It was way prehistoric humans, right? Just what? basic, or they would you consider them a caveman? Yeah, that's sort of as thing. basic as basic gets, because that's kind yeah, of what the statue what would assume. There wasn't any reins on it or anything like that. He just kind of sat on the back of it like a taxi. I <laughs> I cannot. I, I don't know the details. I'm sorry. Um, well, I mean that's that's an interesting subject, though, isn't it? It's an interesting subject. I uh, it's an open. I, I can speculate, but. Even from channel information, it's not clear. It's a nice question to ask several, you know, how much did we overlap? Right. Because suppose Lyrans visited, you know, Lyran refugees came down to Earth and lived here. They might have, you know, have overlapped with dinosaurs time-wise. But, you know, the, there is a nice show, Radio Lab show. I, I wish, if I remember, I will put a link here about dinosaur extinction. Basically, it's pretty well studied. The dinosaurs uh, went extinct. I don't remember exactly the date, but they went, went extinct in a few hours. Just based on how their rema remains, uh, uh, yeah, how yeah, in excavations around. remains yeah. of them, mm -hmm. they, they went extinct in a few hours. So even if humans were there, uh, <laughs> not many humans would survive. Fair enough, Maybe yeah. they, they did, but, but not many. And uh, and um, obviously, after that, the you know, until modern human, a lot of different things happen. It was way, you know, the, the distance is big. I wish I knew the numbers, but I don't. I'm sorry. Well, and uh, when you talk about the channeling over and over, they keep harping on the concept of time is not linear. So to really be able to be one, two, three, four, five, may not, might not. Yeah. Happen. All right. Um, that's. A different topic, nonlinear oh, time. For sure. for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, from it really depends on the perspective and on the language. Uh, mostly, beings who speak about nonlinear time are way distant from our reality. They look at it, at us from a very different perspective, and what they say is comes through a oh, channel okay. and it gets translated. Fair so, from certain perspective, there is no time, right? But from our perspective, you know, everything is there's, time. There's time. Yeah. yeah. Now we have like you know nine thirty-seven. Right. Um, no, I get what you're getting at. Yeah. Um, uh, you can look at the same thing from different perspectives, and it will look very different. Like right, you like circular here, more like rocket-like shape here. So it's it's a different perspective changes the answer tremendously. Uh, I I was also thinking about that before when I started going into it. I, I went into extraterrestrials February 19, uh, no, February 2009, five years ago. 
And until then, I was into mystics a lot, into gods and supernatural a lot, but never paid attention to extraterrestrials. I kind of, since my high school to 2009, which was, you know, for 20-something years, I didn't pay attention. But just looking at the life, I discovered by myself, or I, at least, I mean, the idea might be in the air, but it's, it wasn't obvious at all, that past is influenced by present. Uh, I formulated it, so past, influenced by, by present. I will draw it. So where is past? Let me see if it works. Yeah, it works. Past, present, present, future. So we know timeline. We are in the now, so that's now. And I just noticed that sometimes, you know, and, okay, we know their cause-consequence relationship, right? There is a cause and there is a consequence. And it's always cause first, consequence second. And there is, like, like a person is a consequence of his parents meeting and falling in love. Right. And it's always... First, the parents meet and fall in love, and then there is a consequence. But if you look how the circumstances brought people together, you just get surprised how well-structured that can be. Sometimes very random, very similar random events bring an amazing, amazing result. And when you start looking back how these events come together, you see that sometimes a very strong result kind of puts a shadow down down the past. Like if you look at the especially strong events, you know, for, for us, uh, you know, strong events are like uh, for Russians, um, uh, Russian Revolution or uh, German War, uh, Second World War, or other strong events. I guess for, more, for Americans it would be like, you know, other... I don't want to name them. Mostly, mostly they are negative, but some of them are positive. And uh, you can see how things, like Napoleon is, uh, you know, for Europeans, Napoleon would be the best example. Napoleon was so incredibly lucky. It cannot be like, if you just calculate, it cannot be. It's kind of, he was guided, driven, at least in our reality. Uh, things fell, uh, things, things coincided in a way that brought his luck. But, but, it looks like his luck goes first and things coinciding to make that happen. Mostly miracle. Uh, they kind of fall. The past was built in the future in a very structured way. Uh, in, I know, it, you could, could call it God's providence, but I called it... How did I call it? Uh, cause, consequences, relationships reversed in time. So sometimes the cause is later and mm -hmm. consequence is before, basically meaning that past is created from the goal in the future. And it's not, uh, later I discovered it's not only me, it was actually a dominant idea uh, in, in medieval Europe, mid middle centuries, because uh, you know people were very serious about God's providence and they thought that um, uh, things happen because something later attracts these things. So, so they they were also into that thinking that later event can can uh, attract past events. But you can see how later event kind of spreads their influence in the past. So, so that is kind of from very human, very three D perspective. You can just absorb that. It's sometimes it is just just visible how things fall together to create something in the future. And now Bashar comes and says, you create your past. Past is created from the, from the now. And, and it's sort of the same idea that now creates the past. And sometimes you see how the past changes. You know, most substantial changes are like, again, you know, I, I always look at Russia. In Russia, there is a lot of history books. And when a new dictator comes, new like Stalin or Stalin-like dictator comes, 
Yeah, they rewrite the historical yeah. books, and the whole history changes so radically that that the whole country, all millions of people, just change their mind and believe they believe the new reality, and they believe the new reality so strongly. Hey, I froze there. I uh, believe so strongly that this past changes. You can just you know just because people focus of attention changes by the law of attraction and repulsion. You know what they believe now becomes so real that you know it becomes absolutely real in a way that it becomes a consensus of of this of this country and it's really you know it manifests the past manifests from the now. So that is my understanding why what they say is real. So the future obviously is created from the now and the past is affected by the now. But again, you know. What they say, uh, Bashar and others, uh, is that that by just by changing the now, by changing your thinking about the now, you can change the past, which is true. But and they also say that you know everything is an illusion, and especially uh, now is less illusion than the future and the past, and even the time flow is an illusion, and. Obviously, they are right. No, okay, not obviously, but I agree with them. I agree with them. Uh, I have that sen sensation. I guess the whole life I have sensation that sometimes you feel like you are in some sort of a game, uh, yeah. not necessarily a computer game. In the past, I was thinking about it as a theatrical. I'm, I'm in the theater or in the movie. I'm in the movie, and and my my thinking was that maybe everybody are Actors, they know the truth, but they pretend to be real people. But in fact, they're someone else. They know some answer which they don't let me know. That was my, you know, when I was a child, that was my idea. Why do they behave so strangely? They probably uh, know the truth, but they pretend to play this strange game of life. And and now I, I know the another another analogy is that it is a computer game. But okay, so it's all an illusion. And the time is an illusion, but it is a very good illusion. It's very reliable, especially when you kind of get into it. When you get trained, you're so set into this illusion that it's really hard to escape it. Again, we are coming to the idea of, idea of, of the Matrix. It's, uh, you remember the movie Matrix, Neo, you know, he plays it really well, how he kind of meditates even in the hardest situation. What he has to do, he has to assemble himself in a very... Asian way, Asian um, arts, very mar martial arts. Martial way. You have to get a grasp of reality in a way to transform it. So it's kind of a transformation of reality, which is comes from uh, inner peace and inner understanding the, of the balance. They play it really well in Asian way, Asian martial arts. But also there is a uh, uh, Indian, uh, American Indian way, which is very similar. Um, what's his name? Uh, Don. I Don was, Juan. Yeah, something like that. Don Juan. The teachings of Don Juan. Yes. Carlos Castaneda. Castaneda. Yes, the mm -hmm. same same idea. Castaneda, that you know, you have to regain the balance, and then you can change, transform the reality. Uh, in that specific one, they were talking about um, one of Don Juan's teachers scaling a wall uh, across the waterfall, which he essentially wasn't grabbing anything, um, but he was using from his core, his center core, uh, etherical tentacles that he essentially was dictating from a different time space to look like he was floating across these rocks. And he was asking um, Carlos if he was really seeing what was going on. And all he saw was uh, some dude float. But the whole point of the story is, is that it's that deep type of absolute uh, nowness, so to speak, and that uh, intention that things can literally be transformed to where you can, well, traverse gravity. Yes. So it is possible, but but not frequently. We live in that consensus reality, which He's is a special human. <laughs> Which is uh, uh, 
formed by collective by our collective and our collective agreement is that uh, the time is very real and try to be late for a train or for airplane you know uh, if you're late it's you know it, you can meditate but you know if the plane goes away it goes away it's it's really hard to change the the, the reality in, in this way so you know being late for appointment or getting stuck in traffic it's um, you can manipulate time one way or another but it is it is art it's uh, it's art so uh, what I'm saying is uh, at least from my perspective it is it is more helpful to be where you are you have to have that higher perspective that it is an illusion it helps in some way but 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 only that that help is reasonably limited reasonably limited now when we come to the idea of evolution uh, yeah I guess the same thing there is that past which is consensus now it's galactic consensus when we ask our alien friends about their past about their history the timelines could be different there are multiple timelines there are there is certain flexibility there is certain time travel but but there is also general idea general consensus of the history and some of the species are closer to us they have common history with us and that, that's kind of becomes more solid and some of those are so distant from us that yes their their timeline is so different that we are basically talking about different things and uh, and like like speaking with Bashar they basically are from so different reality that we we overlap only through very few connections um, were there time transfers or uh, time travels through evolution it's possible it is possible when uh, biologists look at generation of species they sometimes they come surprised there are a lot of missing links on this tree phylogenetic tree which I showed there are missing links there is some new feature which comes from nowhere hmm. and these are well documented uh, just Google for missing links in evolution you will find tons of them you know just something gets involved invented and that could be infusion again through through God's will through angelic uh, in between uh, realities helpers who basically construct this world like I call them system administrators programmers there are fairy programmers who program that and aliens right so they infuse us with something which they grab from elsewhere because all that knowledge is sort of available they can look in the future they can look in the past they can create that into their genetic evolution tree um, I guess tough. they're limited by a lot of limitations they're limited by a lot of limitations it has to be benevolent and it has to be positive you know they cannot just manipulate it at random but but still there is a lot of creativity there I tell everybody you know I often tell a story that I was I'm interested in DNA and light and <gasps> light and DNA and healing and things of that sort and how the DNA can be manipulated with light how it is playing its music and energy vibration how the chakras are connected to DNA sequence that sort of thing I, I think there is some sort of a code there and I'm looking for the for discovery of this light code and I was speaking to a Syrian uh, through a different channel or through a Syrian to a Syrian um, lady and she said you'll be working on that but basically she said I will be working on it in a future life for me it was a disappointment but uh, she said I will be an architect of um, of I, as I understand of future species so I will be helping to design new species biological and to design them and I understand now to design them I have to experience this life in full so I understand you know you you program something into the species but then uh, it will have consequences like humans have we have programmed into us short lifespan mm -hmm. much shorter than than aliens we have programmed into us cancer all sorts of genetic disorders 
it's all sorts of mental disorders, all sorts of mental instabilities. It's all kind of partly it is evolved, but partly it is by intention of those who designed us. Partly. So, um, you know, is it a responsible experiment that they did? Are we happy with what they achieved? <laughs> I don't know. It's like we like this. We like this life. It's very interesting, but uh, I wish it was sort of happier, right? Happier, way happier. Mm -hmm. Way happier. All right. Um, let's move back to the idea of infusions. So there are two types of infusions. One type is past. In this phylogenetic tree, they infused us with their DNA many times. And the reasons were multiple. One reason, refugees from different planets, like Lyrans, Pleiadians, they just need some place to live. They move here, create a colony, and because they are different from Earth, they're different. They don't fully can breathe our air. They cannot fully eat our food. They have to adapt themselves. And the best way to adapt to a local planet is to cross themselves with... To hybridize yeah, with whatever lives here. Cool. Initially, it would be like primates, but then it would be humans, and uh, uh, and that is. I asked if you know how often it is in vitro, meaning no love, just in in the in tube, make it in the lab, hybridization, or and how often it is through marriages. And I I understand now that it in most cases it was in the lab hybridization, but. In some cases, it is through through love and marriages. There are, there are some aliens who just fall in love with humans and modify themselves to the level that they can live here, like Lyrans and uh, Pleiadians. They just marry into humans and just live here and uh, and get their offspring and create a, a bloodline of infused, heavy infusion of uh, alien DNA. I know in person one gentleman who is, his father is a Pleiadian. And I, it's obvious from him that he is not from this play. He is, he, he is so so much of a hybrid that, you know, it can can be mistaken. So, so uh, uh, the story is that, you know, his father just chose to live on Earth. Modified himself enough to look like a human and, uh, and, uh, and that's about it. And uh, that happened in this century, past century, centuries before. So we have these infusions and bloodlines of Pleiadian, Liron, and other uh, many other species DNA. Yael. And uh, so one is in vitro, one is uh, through love and uh, marriages. Uh, then it could be through, again, in the past, it could be just through infusions. I don't know, they take, a, again, it is in the lab. They take the DNA and sperm, uh, the sperm, and they take the the egg, fertilize, implant into female. Sometimes they, the technology is so advanced, they can uh, manipulate the DNA within the fetus. So it doesn't have to be before the conception. It can be during the pregnancy. They can manipulate the DNA after the birth. Not all of the DNA, but, but uh, some of the DNA. So it is kind of a diffused line, but uh, the technologies are so good they can do anything. So, so, but it is, we have historic infusions. Some of us are hybrid through generations. We know that our Grandparents were hybrids. So you can you can see that in their photographs, in their behavior, how enlightened they were. And um, it can be now, right? So now uh, that infusion hybridization uh, program again, it happens already. Uh, it already happens, continues. There was a slight interruption in it when they switched from. Unvoluntary to voluntary hybridization. So now, through our site, people right. can apply electronically, and uh, the aliens would uh, consider them for uh, 
hybridization to others or in getting the infusion of alien DNA. So now we finally get to the point of, of infusion of alien DNA. So where do they infuse? I asked and I get some understanding. So let me try to give you an answer, a short answer. So what they do, they use holographic projection. They holographically synthesize the cells, full cells in, in our brain. Mostly they're interested in brains, so they mostly infuse our brains with new alien DNA. Hey, Brian. Um, they they do that now. They do it on voluntary basis after people apply. So you ask for certain Lyran, Pleiadian, Arcturian DNA. So they give you that, and uh, this would be new cells that they put in your body. So we have Brian. Hello. Hello. All right. Nice to see your face. I don't think I have seen him before. Hello. No. Not Thank really. you for joining. Yeah, it's just interesting your topic there. Just... Have, have you been following me? Did you hear what I said before? Yes, uh, about 15 minutes or so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me finish that thought and then I will invite questions. All right, so they create the cells, in new cells in the brain. So the cells have to squeeze between our cells. And they say it take time, takes time, they kind of first create sort of images of the cells, blueprints, and then the cell is sort of materializes there. So it's like transdimensional, slow transdimensional, transdimensional materialization of cells from outside of our dimension into our physical dimension. And in these cells, I guess they pre-program what they put, want to put there. And now it's my guess, they would put some of the human DNA and they would put some of the alien DNA there. And it wouldn't be at random. They would put certain traits which I think they would think are beneficial for you. So so that's my, my, my guess how they do that. Now, what the cells would do, um, here are m many options which I didn't have a chance to ask. One option is just to live there and kind of integrate into the system without in exchanging the genetic information. Another option would be to actually uh, spread spread uh, this genetic information to other cells. There is a mechanism known to science how different cells can exchange genetic information. Uh, and this is through so-called transposons and through viruses. The difference between transposons and viruses is very uh, tiny. Basically, virus is something which is, we know, it goes from outside to inside. But it kind of multiplies in the cell, then jumps out and goes into another cell. And some of the viruses can actually integrate into the genome, into the chromosome, sit there in a dormant form, a sleeping form, silent form, until they are getting activated by something. And then they kind of synthesize more viruses and they go outside. So this can be kind of very explosive, like, you know, like uh, sickness viruses. But this can be also very friendly where viruses behave responsibly and don't really explode. They kind of do it in a slow, un in a slow friendly fashion. So transposons are very similar in a, uh, with, with the only difference they really go outside of the cells, at least the scientists didn't study how they go outside of the cells. They kind of just jump between the chromosomes. It's like kind of almost like viruses, except they don't leave the cell. They multiply outside the of the chromosome, then insert somewhere, and they, they, they jump, and uh, there is a lot of crosstalk. Um, to estimate the rate at which that happens, there is a lot of estimates. But uh, just to have an idea, if you just look in the past, how frequently we had chromosomal jumps between different chromosomes, on average, it's per generation between you and your parent, that was one jump of a transposon from one chromosome to another. It's not that frequent, but uh, sometimes it gets way more frequent. Uh, but but it's on average like would be one jump 
but historically through many generations there is a lot of, of that jump and then sometimes sometimes it is it is uh, there are explosions of uh, uh, of different rearrangements in chromosomes and of course in most cases if it is random it would be just killing uh, the offspring so it wouldn't get into get inherited but sometimes it is either intentionally or unintentionally it becomes beneficial for offspring so it, it gets inherited. I can take a breath and take questions if you like to participate. All right. I guess I'm talking about sophisticated stuff. Uh, so uh, infusions of alien DNA could be done through are done through creation of cells of cells in 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 the brain and in the body, which carry alien DNA, and then these cells have a potential to transfer this this new DNA sequences into other cells. Do you have any comments, questions, discussion? I got all of it. I'm I'm downloading for just fine. Uh, I thought he had a question, but I guess not. All right. Now, um, how can you squeeze more DNA into the cell? Uh, uh, Takur recently, I think it was Takur who said that uh, the alien DNA is not replacing the human DNA. It's kind of an addition. 100% human and then... You know, yes, 100% so human and there is uh, an addition of alien DNA. So I don't know the, the, the answer from them, but how it is possible? Uh, there are multiple ways. First, you can just lengthen the chromosomes. They are already pretty long, uh, so adding more doesn't hurt much. Uh, the length of human DNA is huge. Uh, the cell is tiny, but in one cell, the length, if you just stretch the DNA molecule uh, just in one... Uh, in, uh, whatever, double-stranded DNA, make it one double-stranded strand, it will be uh, two meters long, so it's longer than our height. It's packed really well, and, um, and surprisingly, it's very redundant. Very redundant, meaning um, there is a lot of so-called junk DNA, which is not junk, but which is not overly active. It's, uh, it is there, but it is... Um, I would say it is variable, it is variable meaning fluid, it's uh, evolutionary changing fast. And uh, scientists don't understand what it does. There is fixed DNA and there is uh, wobbly DNA which changes with, with life and with generations. So when the scientists discuss DNA, they mostly talk about DNA which doesn't change much. Uh, it's called coding DNA. It is uh, about 2-3% of DNA is something that scientists do understand what it is. It's called genes. We really, we really know all these genes very well. We know what they do. We know their names. We know their structure more or less. Mo most of the genes we know produce proteins, so we know the whole, the whole molecular biology of that part. Not very well known, but we know, you know, enough details about this. Um, I guess I will start drawing, that would help a little bit. Uh, then there is uh, a lot of non-coding DNA which scientists don't understand well and that is where there is an opportunity to put a lot of stuff there. So that would be 100% all DNA, all two meters of our DNA which is about the size, which is 3 billion, 3 by 10 to the 9th, monomers called nucleotides. So one piece of DNA, one, mole one uh, letter of DNA is called nucleotide. Can you see it? Yes. Nucleotide. Uh, nucleotide contain a base. So scientists usually say we have 3 to the 10 to the 9th, 3 billion bases or 3 billion nucleotides. It's uh, almost the same same uh, monomer, nucleotides. And uh, 10 to the 9th is also called giga, 
So oh, the length of our genome is three, uh, three gigabases, plus minus two percent, and it's well sequenced. So where can you fit alien DNA here? So about three percent we know pretty well. These are our genes. They kind of spread over the genome, but it's just for the lengthwise it's uh, three percent percent is genes. About double that amount, which is, it is something that looks like genes in the genome, very say, similar sequences, but scientists don't know what this does. So this is not protein coding genes, but coding something. It behaves very similarly. Some mysterious gene. I would call them mysterious gene. Mysterious, mysterious genes, which is at least we can see them, but we don't un understand what this, these sequences do. There is about up to 50% of unique DNA, unique, non-repetitive, unique DNA. We know the sequence, and we are pretty sure that doesn't do anything we understand. It is there. It is sort of not as well conserved. Genes are really well conserved. Mysterious genes, really well conserved. They don't change from mice to humans much. The same sequence, very conserved through the humans and in the past in, into the previous species. This unique, unique, is real, unique, relatively variable sequence, relatively variable. It's, it, it varies more, but and we don't see the structures there, so we, the scientists don't understand what it is. There is so there is tons of sequence which, uh, if you change it, not nothing very bad happens usually. And there is about another half, which is called junk DNA, which is not junk, but it's just called this way. And it's largely repetitive. It's repetitive. About 10% is made by one sequence. One sequence repeated a million times. It's called, my favorite sequence is called ALU. Uh, about 300 bases uh, repeat, repeated a million times. 10 to the 6 is a million. Uh, randomly, uh, you know, across the genome, almost randomly, but it's kind of spread all, all, all across the genome. And there is tons of other repetitive sequences there, repetitive sequences. And uh, scientists just have very little clue what they do. So in this about, so 3%, about 90%, 91%, in this 91%, the alien can place a lot of sequence without Anyone, anyone noticing and without affecting the main biological functions. Especially in this repetitive part, there is tons of opportunity to place anything. And it is not very well uh, structured in, uh, in length. So if you just take, say, a mouse and replace, you do that. You take the mouse sequence and take a piece and just move it elsewhere. Usually it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, change the phenotype. Doesn't change the the uh, mm, how do you call them um, the the health of offspring uh, at all. You can't really see any difference. So so the sequence how it's all uh, the order of the genes doesn't is not that much fixed in the genome. So if if there are chromosomal Rearrangements uh, in many many cases it, it doesn't affect much the the health of their offspring. Any questions so far? So um, so and that is wonderful. There is a lot of opportunities. So genome is very the genome the sequence of the genome is very. How do you call the chromosomes? Are very uh, allowing for rearrangements, allowing for insertions, and even the human scientists, because the human scientists don't know the sequence of Liron and Pleiadian DNA. <laughs> if anybody inserted their Liron or Pleiadian DNA, they wouldn't even notice. There is no way. There is no way to for them to notice that. Uh, because it is the genome is sort of from human perspective is such a mess. If you say if you look at their code of windows, and uh, you can't even see what is inserted there or what is changed there because you can't really read it well. So this is very similarly 
the human genome is, uh, we kind of know the sequence and we know the letters, but uh, we, uh, the scientists cannot really read that well. The scientists can recognize this, 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 this genes, you know, they can recognize them pretty well, but beyond that, 90, 91% is mostly uh, barely, barely understood, so there is a lot of uncharted territory in the genome which can be manipulated a lot. Brian, do, do you have any comments and questions? I'm open now. <coughs> well, mm, so what you're saying here is with all this, um, this, this uh, genetic makeup that you've, that you've um, drew a schemata as to how, um, as to how the genetics, the, the junk, junk stuff there that you're referring to, and there's no way of, uh, of identifying any type of uh, mysterious, uh, I guess you can say, added DNA with regards to the alien, where they say when they inject some type of uh, their DNA into your system, there's no way that, that the scientists of, of t or science of night up today can can actually recognize this kind of stuff. So so then, where exactly are we headed here with this kind of stuff? Man? Like, uh, are we going into the unknown mystery of of uh, of a new evolution, or or what's your what's your uh, hypothesis on this? Thank you. Uh, I guess two questions. First is: Is it true that scientists cannot? I will. Switch the camera back. Is it true that scientists cannot um, uh, identify? I guess a mainstream scientists, you know, for them it's just unthinkable to think about alien yeah. fusion. So they cannot do it just because they can think about it. They don't want to risk their career. So there is very practical reasons for them not to do that. Um, and there was, I'm blanking on his name, there was a nice scientist. I'm, I guess it's a shame that I, I forget his name. He, he just recently died. It was pretty tragic because uh, he was close to sequencing the alien DNA. He was collecting the money. It was a very promising project, but he died from cancer. And again, I'm thinking about conspiracy. Maybe somebody, some bad guys just wanted him to die from cancer. Uh, so I will Google. It's like called um, a star child. I'll st star child, and I will remember his name. I was in communication with him, but so I somehow not prepare star child yes I found him star child project unfortunately he um, yeah he didn't finish it he sequenced alien DNA oh gosh it wants me to like on Facebook and his name is not on the surface of the site all right so uh, I found the project, Star Child project. So uh, there, there was a skull, alien skull found, and it ended up in hands of uh, a true researcher who really understood that it was an alien skull, and he really wanted to to sequence it. Um, I'm just, just a second. I'm reading his. I they don't name. You know, his name is removed. I guess. It's a shame not to know his name. All right. Uh, can, while, while I'm talking, can you Google Star Child and find the researcher name? It should be very easy. Can you? Star Child researcher. Images. Lloyd Pike. Yes, Lloyd Pike. Here we go. Uh, I can share the screen with you now. Share screen, share. Here we go. So that's my uh, friend, Lloyd Pye. I don't know, I'm sorry if I, I kind of blanked on his name, but uh, he found the, you know, he was given, I mean, uh, he was given by someone, he was given their, the skull, and uh, he was a good researcher, so when he sees that it's not a human skull, he he um, um, there was a lot of differences. It was clearly non-human. 
he recognized it's non-human. It not, doesn't even connect to our human lineage. It was so alien that it couldn't even fit in our genetic, you know, phylogenetic tree. So logically, the next step would be to uh, to sequence it, and uh, from the bone, you can get the DNA. And he got the first sequences. He, I guess, he found found funded himself. He found friends who who were and you know, sequencing is cheap. It just you know, it just takes you know, many labs do a lot of sequencing. So at some point, he got a little bit of money to sequence few genes, and uh, and he found that this skull is as distant from humans as frogs are. It's so uh, it's not rel related to frogs, but it is so un non earthly, unearthly that it is not even is not as as distant as as uh, frogs. Uh, but it had DNA, so there were sequences. The sequences I don't know if I can find the sequences. I'll try to star child sequences. Give me the sequences and uh, sequences. Yeah. Um, Oh, here we go. Okay, on this on this graph, on this graph, it looks like it is still between the some sort of Neanderthal and Chimps. Uh, but I don't know what graph it is. I, I I remember when when I read it, it was farther than Chimps from us than farther than Chimps. So I guess that's the sequence graph. Um, so it just shows comparison of different. Ah, I guess I didn't get to it. It just shows the comparison of different sequences. So, so that's how the scientists look at their at the different sequences, and uh, image. And uh, so, can you see it? So you look at different uh, things and see how similar they are, and highlighted are the the letters which are different. So that's a typical scientific approach to finding. Uh, uh, something. Now, if you want to see the alien DNA, you have to logically you would have to either get an alien sample of alien DNA, which is possible, not not impossible. Mm. I have a, another friend in ufology who seems to have a sample of gray gray blood, and um, he also wants to sequence. But again, to find the money for that, it's not not that simple. Uh, I'm, pro I'm pretty sure in uh, our secret projects in uh, Area 51 they have all tons of sequences and all tons of samples, but it's not it's not something which is in public domain. Even in uh, uh, museums like uh, how do you call it main museums of archaeology, they have hidden artifacts of uh, there are books of secret archaeology, hidden artifacts of of their alien bones and alien stuff, but again, it's it's not in the public view. So, the only public project, as I know, is by Lloyd Pye, who unfortunately died prematurely. He was very energetic, but uh, I, I I suspect it was a conspiracy just to to kill him with cancer. In any way, um, so another way would be to take um, hybrids. And hybrids who know that I, they are from the certain lineage, and compare these hybrids to uh, non-hybrids, which would be like the majority of people, just to average majority DNA, and see what what the what sequences are different. I'm not in big favor of this project because if humans will be able to genotype hybrids, and if humans become afraid of aliens. They might become afraid of hybrids, and then we are in trouble. So that is not my favorite project. I wouldn't, uh, uh, I wouldn't promote it. It's very fun to prove that you know there is a hybridization program, but I think uh, I already believe in it. I already speak to aliens. Why do I need to develop the ways to tell apart the hybrids from non-hybrids? It could, uh, it could lead to some sort of genocide of hybrids, which I don't like. Uh, it's like the idea is on the surface. I mean, I mean it's in the sci in sci-fi literature, so people are you know there is tons of movies about hybrids, so so it's already on the surface, and uh, there are different scenarios, and some of them are very unhappy. 
That was first question. Uh, what was the second question? Ah, how that will affect the humanity in the future, right? That's what you asked, Brand. I guess you you disconnected. Um, yeah, that's sort of, sort of more or less. Where uh, does it lead? Um, yeah. Oh, that's uh, again. That's a nice question to the aliens. They know what they do, uh, and they say uh, that unless we ascend, we are doomed. I guess that's the main answer. Unless we ascend, we are doomed. And ascension is telepathy. We have to develop telepathy and unite to be able to ascend. Telepathy is a quality which we are capable of, but it can be boosted through genetic manipulations. So average humans are capable of telepathy if they grow up in telepathic culture. So if you take a human embryo and or yeah, I guess embryo, and just teleport into their world and uh, impregnate an alien hybrid, and the embryo is born in a four-dimensional world. We know that these children are fully telepathic and uh, fully four-dimensional. So genetically, you don't need to manipulate humans to make them four-dimensional. Uh, we know we were communicating with uh, a planet, Utopia Five through a channeler, uh, Utopia Five in Andromeda system. This planet it has Pleiadians from Pleiades, so Andromeda is a different galaxy, but Pleiadians were transferred there, and they have a planet there, a civilization there. And uh, in the times of uh, Romans, they took um, a Roman Empire, they took Roman uh, human slaves from Roman Empire, and took them as slaves. Later, the slaves were liberated and became citizens of this planet. And this is clearly a four-dimensional planet. And we have humans, genetically humans, who live there, look like humans, dimensional and telepathic. So, and there is more examples of that. So genetically, we are just fine for telepathy, and we're just fine for four-dimensional life. It is our collective... collective... Mm, Slow, de slow, slow development. Our collective slow development that we don't, as as a civilization, we don't get there because uh, we uh, teach our children to live third-dimensional life, and we don't know how to teach our children to live telepathic four-dimensional life. There is no no place on Earth which can uh, foster, which does foster higher-dimensional life. I guess. Maybe some uh, some places are there. We just on uh, uh, some uh, I would assume Tibetan or Indian or some other nice places where there are there is there are cultures. But uh, individuals there, after lots of training and meditation, can do higher dimensional things. But but it's not mainstream. Clearly, like there is mainstream which is dragging us down. So. Uh, so one of the reasons for the aliens to infuse the, t the genes into us would be to help us develop telepathy and help us to live a more four-dimensional life. And the second reason, which they clearly state, they are not afraid to state it, and it was answered many times, that they hope to incarnate in us. And they, uh, they are their souls better incarnate and... Uh, in better genetically designed beings, so they infuse their DNA to help us to become more uh, better vessels for the souls of higher dimensional souls. So that would be the second. It's about the same, but uh, just a little different perspective. Or Max, are we sort of like a little? This uh, planet is sort of like a little uh, test. Uh, how was I, was I thinking about these different our existence as humanity as well and and I've been following your uh, program for 
since almost back when it almost it's just when it started up, I guess you can say. And um, I also, you know, you you sort of surf the web and you go and check out different, different, different analogies, different perspectives on our existence, and a lot of it is kind of fluffy, but yet um, you kind of wonder sometimes, man, you know, like like where are these people's where is the ideology coming from and 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 where is the uh, the uh, influence for this type of of um, mindset that we've been been I guess you could say working through as humans as well trying to figure out well okay we're here we're doing this where do we come from uh, how do we continue to I guess you can take to I guess ascend. I guess you can say to a to a, a higher state of being or higher state of of um of um I guess you can how am I looking for a word a higher state of thinking. I guess you can say so we can we can become uh, a better human being. I guess you could say. So uh, I'm just kind of wondering if like like the Kerr and all the different um, Different aliens that have been channeling through, through Jim and various people, other people as well, and we seem to be like a little bit of a, a, a kind of like a little bit of a, a test test planet or something. <laughs> what's your what's your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, we are a test planet. We are a test planet. No question. It's a big experiment. Yeah. Which. Uh, wasn't planned like that, but when it came this way, they said, oh, well, that's interesting. It becomes even more interesting than the initial experiment. Let's let's uh, support it. Let's keep it going. Um, I guess Buddhism is, uh, is gives a huge clue what is happening. Um, somehow, we were, most of us have, have been incarnated on other planets and lived much higher dimensional lives. So as souls, we already experienced four dimension well, many of us. So in past lives, we have been four dimension. And then uh, we just came here to this density, which is one of the densest densities in, uh, I guess, in the galaxy. And uh, we get trapped here because there is some attraction to what we do here. It's so interesting. So we live here that life, then we go in the seventh dimension and that place of discarnate spirits to learn our lessons. And we have free choice here and we have free choice there. And we just choose to come back. Or we say, yeah, you know, fourth dimensional is cool, but in a third dimensional, oh, that is something. How about I jump back and learn something else here? So it is our collective choice. On average, we just choose to come back in this nonsense and keep keep suffering and keep experiencing all this, all this uh, uh, full spectrum, wide spectrum of uh, of life, of emotions and experiences. We keep experiencing a wide spectrum of experiences, dark and light and all of that, and we get trapped there. So Buddha said, you know, finish that nonsense, go back to, to the light. You don't need to reincarnate in this darkness anymore, but, but uh, we don't listen. We don't listen. We keep, keep doing that. Sort of so, like a school yeah. of hard knocks. Eh? <laughs> sort of like the school of hard knocks. I don't know what it is. Hard what? School of hard, school of hard knocks. <laughs> it's an American, it is, but, but it's an American expression. All right. Yeah, yeah boot camp, yeah, like... Uh, but of life, you, you, but of life. Try to, 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 uh, um, to, what's the word? Your head of the wall, what do you do? The head, ban, try to bend your head on the wall, head of the wall, and you feel like sparkles go from your eyes, and you say, yeah, it's painful, but let me bang again, right? That sort of thing. Um, <laughs> So where does it go? Uh, no, your question was: Is it our 
an experiment. Yes, it is an experiment. Um, Bashar says we don't need television. We don't watch television. We don't watch movies. We just watch you. He says to us, and uh, we are being watched by the whole galaxy with uh, with uh, surprise. They're very surprised what we do. And until recently, they didn't even understand us. But now they sort of they meet our colonists up there, meet our friends, us there, and now they understand much better why we do what we do. But still, they uh, there is a lot of um, surprise and sadness, and they don't really approve what we do here, uh, collectively and even individually. You know, we seem to be enlightened, but still, you know, if they were in our shoes, they would do it very different. Like Yael are very surprised by our desire for luxury. They are so stoic. That is a word. You know, ascetic. They're so ascetic. You know, they would. Uh, you know, they wouldn't do anything. You know, which uh, which we do like. You know, um, uh, beautiful houses, beautiful dress, beautiful furniture. They, you know, they would live in blank walls and wear very simple simple clothes and uh, ignore the pleasures of life. That's uh, Yael. Uh, and that's what they do when they incarnate here. Uh, Pleiadians uh, uh, don't approve of our practicality. They, you know, they laugh at our practicality. You know, they say we are much bigger than that. Don't be practical. And so on. The yes. thing is, Max, why is there such a, uh, a diverse from from a uh, from people enjoying the luxury to people having the basic needs on their table uh, is is their form of luxury as well. Such a, a broad spectrum of of a, a form of um, I guess you can say uh, what we call enjoying the life itself. Eh? There's this is from from wars to I mean there's a whole gamut of um, of a uh, total experiences that <laughs> that I kind of wonder myself is like what like, like why or what, like why is this such a uh, such a, a diverse experience? Eh? You can go, you can come into a famine, or you can come into where the uh, where the spoils are 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 beneficial, you know, or you can say uh, bountiful. Eh? So like like I can't figure this out. Like you know why. Why is why such a spectrum of experiences? Do we need it for our for each individual's growth as we come in and, and right. inhabit um, inhabit that that body? Um, I don't know. I don't know why. Um, there is that strange human collective entity, human collective, which is basically a summary of our souls. Um, a small like spiritual collective thing, high collective entity which decides what they want to do with Earth. And their free will is very respected. So, you know, they are maybe the first ones who decide what they want from Earth collectively. And and they have you know they collaborate, I guess, collaborate with some sort of creator type of entity, creator type of in personality, intelligence, which has the right to change a lot in this reality. They can uh, uh, do miracles on a global scale. They probably wouldn't do miracles on individual scale, but they would could do miracles on global scale. They can, uh, I think, they can change some of the parameters of the matrix. Parameters of the matrix, like uh, astrological parameters of the matrix. Uh, uh, you know, uh, people who pay attention to astrology, some days are good, some days are bad, some days are lucky, some days you better stay low, and, and so on. So um, they can uh, send angelic helpers and things like that. So the whole, the whole um, experiment can be affected by many, many ways which are not quite visible to us. I have a very strong feeling that it is manipulated by much higher consciousnesses, like creator type of beings and consciousnesses. They they uh, have ways to influence us. Like when the war comes, it's uh, 
part of that is because of uh, local events, but if you look at different events around the globe at the same time, like there is a nice book called 1968, Google it, it's Chip and it there is an audio version. It's an amazing book, very nice to read. It's like the top uh, highest point of hippies uh, and highest point of Vietnam War, highest point of uh, freedom movements. Uh, obviously, absolutely independent from each other, different countries from. Russia, Czechoslovakia, to Cuba, to Mexico, had uh, very st strange events which came from nowhere. People just went to the streets, basically. That was the main event. People went to the streets for no reason. I believe it was some divine influence. I mean, it, at least it was some unmeasured influence which wasn't physical. It was non-physical influence. So we have a lot of those. Uh, what was the question? I'm I'm kind of get excited about that thing and I, I lose it. Experiment is it uh, is it controlled experiment or this experiment went astray? I guess that's the main question, right? Mm. I believe it is still controlled and there are different timelines, and some of them are very unhappy. Some of them are happy. We are in the middle somewhere, and. Um, we play our part, they play their part. It is a lot of consciousnesses trying to get it the most interesting way. So one of the ways is just to get best experiences from that, right? I guess it is one of the main results. But also they want to get us through and on the other side there could be something even better than experiences. Like uh, there is a whole series of books called Explorer Race by Robert Shapiro, uh, where the, you know, the main point of the whole series of books, lots of different channel beings say that we are an explorer race and the main component, main factor which makes us different from all other aliens is that we are explorers. We have this uh, urge to go and explore, to expand and explore, like, like Star Trek explorers, like you know, like all of us, like we have that ideal of being of doing exploration. So when we graduate from 3D into 4D, we will add to the galaxy that the whole civilization of explorers, which uh, will transform the whole galaxy, basically. That's you know one of their one of their most hopeful messages we get from many beings. We will make it and will create a civilization of explorers. It cannot be individual, it is civilization-wide phenomenon. We will uh, make it into uh, something which will transform the galaxy into something very interesting. And on this nice note, I will start wrapping up. I remember, I mean, on my list there was another DNA thing which I wanted to say. In addition to things we inserted in chromosomes, so there is one dimension. Within chromosome, we can insert things. Another thing, you can insert cells. So we have our brain with cells, human cells, but we have inserted alien cells, which add some functionality. I didn't go about all dimension of fields, energy, energy fields. I guess I will leave it till next time. But keep in mind that DNA could be or is an antenna for transdimensional communications and large part of our consciousness is outside of our physical mind and we communicate to it transdimensionally. So that's a big topic for discussion which I announced but I didn't get to it today. So a part of the reason why we need uh, to insert alien DNA and part of the reason you know the whole topic of DNA activation is that DNA works as a laser, another big topic, a laser uh, cavity, a laser cavity which generates certain physical vibration which connects us to to other dimension and that helps transdimensional things like channeling, telepathy, telepathy is transdimensional, it's not physical and uh, ascension which is a dimensional elevation. So that is one, one component I want to, wanted to mention 
I will continue some other time. And another component I wanted to mention is outside of chromosomes there are so-called extra chromosomal, exochromosomal, extra chromosomal, exochromosomal DNA pieces. So they can um, add these DNA pieces outside of chromosomes. So our chromosome stay, stays intact and they kind of create a new little artificial chromosome and they can put there whatever they want. So we would get an extra one of few mini, mini chromosomes where they can add stuff. Which is, human scientists do that, it's pretty easy. So aliens can do that way better than we do. And uh, that would give us new qualities. And I, I, telepathy is one of them and dimensional manipulation would be another, another one of them. I thank you very much, my dear uh, listeners and participants. You are so valuable to me. It's it's nice to have someone on the other side who listens. It would be very, very sad just to speak into their empty room, which I could do, but it's different. Having you on the other side is, is joyful. And thank you, five viewers. I know you are there, so thank you. And I know there is a time delay. You will see me in, in about two minutes. By that time, I will already finish. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, my future listeners. Um, it is intentionally sort of, I didn't practice, I wanted to to present it in a way which is sort of free flow in thought. <clears throat> and I guess in the future I will try to jump it into something very concise and very uh, sort of uh, uh, logically built. So it could be created into a 10, 10 minute uh, lecture on how things are, but again, many of these things are guesses. We don't know many much stuff, but we do we do know much stuff, and we do know much stuff stuff more than many other people. We do know more than scientists because scientists just are blinded by many things, and we know more than non-scientists because non-scientists don't think much about DNA. They know that DNA can be twelve-stranded. Oh, that's another big topic. I believe 12 stranded it's not in our dimension. In our dimension it is two stranded. Everything else is other dimensional. And with that I bless you. I want to give you some blessing. DNA is a stair. It's a spiral. It's a dance of two things which never touch each other. They always go around each other as lovers. One leading, one one strand is leading, one is behind, following, one leading, one following, and they go in a spiral, and the spiral is yin and yang. And if you turn them upside down, they also go, so the leading becomes following, the following becomes leading, so it is yin and yang in many ways, which can switch back and forth. It is something very godly, very miraculous. Simple atoms, we understand the structure, but it works all the living things in our planet have DNA, and now we know most of the living things in other planets have the same DNA as we do. They can come here and cross with us. It is God everywhere. DNA is very godly, it's very miraculous. It is a crystal which is maybe one of the main things which connects us to our other spiritual part. It is it is very material. You can put it in a tube, you can actually see it. You can actually see it. It is very material and it is very immaterial. When it is live, it is very alive and very spiritual. Spirit, I believe spirit connects to our body through DNA in much, much of the connection of the spirit to our body through DNA. I believe chakras, chakras are in large extent are connected to our DNA. I bless your DNA, I bless your spiral nature, I bless your snaky nature, I wish your DNA to sparkle with life. I wish you DNA to be evolving 
into something beautiful and connect you to something wonderful and godly. I bless you, be blessed, and illuminated your path. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. See you, see you later. Bye.